from The Athletic joins us, gets her own theme music on the Patrick Netherton Show. I don't know if she gets treated that way on any other show, but Dagnabbit, she deserves it for uh, the good work she's put out. Nicole, are you? do you know where you are and what day it is? Uh, no, no, <laughs> none of the above. Um, it's, it's always a long season, and then there was that extra break in between, you know, the semis and the title game, and you know, the game was so long and uh, you stay up till four or five in the morning one night and then, you know, can't sleep straight for the rest of the week. So I'm still in that in that post uh, title game phase. But the good thing is it's off season. So I can just, you know, goof around, watch Netflix all day and uh, and relax. Yeah, you got to catch up on season two of you, right? Uh, that's that's the next thing. Yeah, that... I haven't done that yet. Oh, I've well, not uh, done that yet. Yeah, uh, I don't. You know, I, I'm I'm that's not that's not my deal. I'm more of a glow guy. I like the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. That's more more my my speed. Um, all right, Nicole, tell me about how this because you ended up writing the story of of Trevor Lawrence dealing with his first collegiate loss, and, and it's very fascinating. What was your intent? I mean, were you following them no matter what, or was that something that came about as the game went along? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I've been, um, you know, paying a lot of attention, close attention to Clemson all season, um, being, being co-hosting our podcast with my colleague Grace Rayner. So um, certainly, you know, was was probably leaning towards doing something on that side. But it just depended on, you know, the way the game was going to go. And um, certainly, you know, there were a lot of great storylines on both sides. And, and once that became clear that, you know, Clemson was going to lose this game, I wanted to see what that loss looked like for the first time for, for Trevor Lawrence. And, you know, it's not even that it's just his first college loss, but this is someone who really didn't lose a lot in high school either. Um, and, you know, a lot had been made of his last loss in, in November 2017, the, the team, the quarterback, and all those people who beat him. But that was a big upset. I mean, he had been, you know, back-to-back state champs, undefeated seasons. Like, this is someone who just really does not ever lose much at all. And, um, you know, he, he's so even, you know, even keeled and cool and calm under pressure. Even when they win, you know, the most we get out of him is like a smile. But so I figured he would handle it well. But I certainly wanted to see how people around him were going to act and how he was going to, you know, really address it for the first time. And, um, you know, I just think it's I, I think it's interesting. And, and we're so used to, um, you know, kind of not remembering that these still are, you know, in a lot of cases, teenagers 20 year olds and yeah. they're still you know they're still growing up and they're they're learning how to handle these things um and so that's that's really what i wanted to to see and um you know that's exactly you know kind of what i got by following him around you know from the moment that that game ended did anything surprise you about any of the reactions um you know no not really um, i mean i did i did find it interesting you know what his coaches were telling him and and specifically the, kind of how they were trying to pump him up because you know, he did not play a great game, and, and there were some overthrows that we weren't used to seeing out of him. Certainly, as a team, Clemson was just atrocious on third downs, and, um, you know, he had that fumble late in the game. I really feel the deal. Uh, he referred to it as a dagger for, for LSU. So, you know, there was definitely some of this, like, you know, how do you, you know, tell a guy who's done so much for you for the last two years um, but didn't play well, but you can't put the whole game on him. How do you approach that? And so I thought it was really interesting, you know, his coaches talking about, you know, reminding him about all he had accomplished, what he had done to get them to this point. And then this idea that, you know, like, it'd be great if everyone you loved and cared about in life never had to deal with any sort of obstacles or mm-hmm. anything not going their way. But that's not realistic, and this is more realistic, that you go through something where you don't get what you want and that you prepared for, and you have to respond to it. So. Um, I just thought those messages are really interesting because, you know, as you know, so much of sports is, is mental and psychological. And um, I, I was really curious to see kind of how they were going to frame that to him. And, um, you know, he answered every question. He was really gracious. He talked a lot about relying on his face and things like that. But, um, you know, he did parrot some of those some of those talking points that people have been really trying to get through to him in, you know, obviously his most disappointing moment of his football career so far. I'm curious that you mentioned that you kind of followed Clemson and you do have a podcast that sort of revolves around them. Um, have you at any point, have you and Trevor ever talked about uh, his hair? <laughs> no, and um, if, you know, if the hubbub around him at Media Day had been a little bit less so, I did want to talk to him about his decision to wear it down and not put it up in a ponytail. Yeah. 
you know, as, as someone who has long hair, like that's sweaty, that's gross, but he doesn't seem to sweat as much as a normal person. So, um, that could be part of it, but you know, at some point I will get down to the bottom of the, the ponytail question. Look, if anyone is, that I know as a national writer can get to the bottom of, of Trevor Lawrence's hair care routine, I feel like you're the one because you have Thank taken you. on. That's, I agree. Well, you've taken on some of the more in, interesting stories this year, and it, it's kind of become a fun little little niche, sort of a side niche for you. Is finding some of these, you know, the the knitter at the at, at you know the one game. Uh, you, you found. Our, well, no, cro- wait, is it knitting? Wait, you you corrected it me one crochet. time. Crochet. Crochet. Yeah, you corrected me the last time we mm-hmm. talked about this. So I want to make sure I got mm-hmm. it right. Uh, you know that the 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 lady that jumped into the hedges. And and you know fell into the hedges and disappeared. I mean, you've you've had some fun this college football season. And to be honest with you, it's refreshing because you can only read so many different people putting their spin on what what happened during the game and breaking down the game. I need some stuff that gives me some of the lighter side and and some of the more uh, fun stories that go on around college football. And I appreciate you doing that. Thank you, thank you. And yes, that's that's another reason why I do feel like I need to put Trevor Lawrence's hair care questions on the top of the list. I mean, it, my people need this. Probably. Yes. Your, your audience demands this. There is, yes. there, and I was actually, honestly, the only thing I was really mad about is that at no point during the national championship game, did I see something so bizarre that I thought, okay, we've got to get Nicole on this. <laughs> That's okay. Sometimes I can just enjoy the actual football. Too. Yeah. And, right, they, and so you had to just go write an actually really good profile of Trevor Lawrence's first loss. You just had to do real journalism at that point. So yeah. You know, yeah. Sorry. Right, actual, actual on the field content. Yeah. Hate that for you. Uh, talking to Nicole Auerbach <laughs> from the athletic as, uh, as we r- r- sort of wrap up the college football season, all right, we all are. We all are, are. You know, recency bias is a real thing, right? Everything is the greatest thing of all time, especially when it gets amplified by social media. Where do you put Joe Burrow's season, and and you know, a single season for a quarterback? It feels like the best ever, but are we discounting other seasons that have come before it? Well, we definitely are. I mean, this is absolutely some recency bias here because. Um, this is what we do. This is what we do. And also in this era of football, the stats are crazy. And you're asking quarterbacks to be responsible for so much. And there's more possessions and there's, you know, the, the spread and the dual threat guys we are running and they're doing all these things that, you know, make it hard to compare to quarterbacks of different eras. I do think as a team, the 2019 um, LSU team and their season will be up there with, you know, Nebraska in, in 2001, Miami and those mm-hmm. those perfect you know those seasons where uh, they're an all timer and I think you know once we get a little bit far removed we can actually kind of have those debates about those individual seasons but from a quarterback standpoint I mean I think absolutely and the other one that comes to mind is Cam Newton and mm-hmm. um, you know the difference there and I mean again we're going to have plenty of time to parse through it is you know the lack of NFL talent around Cam that season right and how much more he had to personally do. Um, but yeah, I mean, Joe Burrow, the completion percentages, um, his efficiency, the amount of touchdowns, all of these things are going to put him in that conversation. And he might, I mean, Joe Burrow basically had a perfect season. Yeah. Um, he did not have a bad game. He did not even have like a bad half, maybe a bad quarter. You could say maybe the first quarter of the title game, but he finishes with almost 500 yards passing. So like, you know, he it will be in that conversation. I'm just, I do think there's a little bit of recency bias to declare it right now, but we're going to have lots of time to parse through that and, and really figure out where these things stack up in college football history. But absolutely going to be right up there in that in that conversation, if not the best. Uh, Nicole, I will tell you that he did have one very real struggle in a first quarter, and that's when he was down seven to three to the Northwestern State Demons. So uh, just okay. put that just okay. just remember that. Hey. It was 24-14 okay. at halftime. I'm just saying uh, uh, maybe the toughest test LSU got in a first half all season was Northwestern State. So I just want to put that okay, out there. Okay, sure. Well, I mean, I still think it was the first quarter of the title game, but yeah, I'll, right. I'll give you your – I mean, your look, they were never down 10 to the Demons, all right? But they were down 7-3 to three at the end of the quarter. Just saying Northwestern State may be the best college football team uh, this season behind LSU. Uh, talking to Nicole Auerbach from The Athletic. All right, so what's what's next for you now? I know you get to decompress a little bit from football season, but uh, I would assume you're you're you get 
you know, you change. You were at USA Today. Now you're back. You're over at the Athletic. What's your basketball schedule look like? Do you, if you have one. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot less. We have a great staff that does a great job covering college hoops year round, and um, so I'll probably pitch the occasional story. I'll I'll watch games, do stuff like a fan, um, and go from there. It helped out in March the last couple of years, so I don't know yet, if, you know, what the schedule is for that, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you know, if you, if you go to the athletic and read the college basketball site, you'll be covered no matter what. Um, but I think, you know, like like most of us now, um, who especially, you know, been in college football crazed areas, you know, now we're turning our attention and trying to catch up on what has already been just an absolutely bonkers college basketball season. So it seems like a good time to uh, to check in and start fully engaging. One of the things you have done, and I appreciate, is you've kept up with. Uh, the commissioners of the various conferences. I know you talked to the new Big Ten commissioner coming in, and you've also dealt a bit about on the expansion, the playoff expansion. Mm -hmm. Uh, Give me your feel for where you think they are in terms of expanding to eight teams because, again, they all recognize that they set up a playoff where one team's going to get left out, one conference is going to get left out, or sometimes two conferences if Notre Dame gets in. Where do you feel like they are in terms of expansion of the playoffs? Well, you know, as, as you know, just like, you know, we all do a year ago um, when people decided, hey, we want to talk about this. We want to look at the size and the format and how things are going and possible, you know, expansion, the size and the way this will work, the rounds and all these things. Um, that was that was a big deal because, you know, the first five years of the playoffs, people didn't do that. People just said everything is fine. Um, as is. And now we're at this point where they want this kind of constant evaluation of the system. Um, and to me, what that says is, okay, now we're, you know, kind of, we have a license to have these conversations. So we're going to have them every time we meet as commissioners, as presidents, um, you know, who are tasked with kind of overseeing this whole thing. And they're also looking at, you know, there are a ton of obstacles that they would have to face if they wanted to try to expand it before the contract's up. But, you know, now we're on the other side of 2020, and you're looking at it, and you're saying, all right, well, this takes you through the end of the 2025 season. Um, You know, we're going to have to get involved in negotiations before that, obviously. And maybe now that's just, you know, a realistic time frame for figuring out what the format we want for the next TV contract will be. And right now, now we have a couple years and no major rush to look at that. Um, and it's not to say that it would never, that there's no possibility that they would look at expanding before the contract's up, but they're looking at it right now saying that's a reasonable time to um, to make changes if we want to make changes, and there's no pressure. It gives us the luxury of time to do that and evaluate and look at different formats and models, whatever we would want to look at for change without, you know, like a, a hard deadline um, on the back end. So. You know, it's definitely in the phase basically where it's been since, you know, kind of everyone's was like, all right, we're allowed to have these conversations and talk about it. Um, and they are talking about it. So it's basically just an ongoing conversation. When these groups meet, they meet in person a couple times a year. Um, they met Monday morning before the championship game. And then, you know, obviously there's communication throughout the year. But as you know, college football moves slowly. And um, it took a long time, even after there was a consensus, to get to a 14 model and exactly how it was going to look. So um, to me, the idea that they are embracing this idea that they have a few years before they would need to negotiate with the ESPN again about, you know, the TV contract. Right. Um, you know, that makes sense to me that that would be that they're going to take that time because, again, people don't like to move super, super fast in the college football phase. No, it's uh, it's a leviathan. There's no doubt about it. Nothing yeah. moves fast in, in college athletics. Uh, that's for sure. You, what do you, what do you think? It, it, there, there's two trains of thought with the NCAA and this Odell Beckham stuff, him handing out cash or whatever. Uh, one seems to be it's a slap on the wrist. You know, the players have to pay the money back. They probably have to disassociate with Odell Beckham. The other is the NCAA makes an example out of this to say, hey, no other boosters need to be doing this kind of stuff. We're going to give it, you know, LSU a harsh penalty. Where do you fall on what you think the NCAA does with this? Well, I don't know if they can, like, they're, they're not going to be able to go outside of, you know, kind of the, the, the bylaws and, and the rules themselves to make an example, um, because this is a, is a relatively minor issue. Um, and, right, if it's, it, it could just be disassociating with o, OBJ as a booster and paying back the money, right? And then it could be done. 
um, which that seems to be the most realistic um, outcome here. But um, and and that's really what it is by the book. When there have been situations like this, it's just obviously you know a bigger deal because things are caught on video and it's OJ and and. It's not like, I mean, even if they disassociate with him as a booster, I mean, I can't imagine that LSU would not ever engage with OBJ and that he wouldn't engage with them. I mean, like, this is still one of their most prominent, um, you know, former players. Sure. So, like, I mean, either, there's probably parameters around, like, what he could engage in a booster, you know, you know, way versus, like, as a, as a you know, an alum or whatever it is that's different. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think that it's going to be, too, too big of a deal, um, and I mean, everyone's saying all the right things about taking it seriously and investigating these things. Um, but I think, you know, honestly, like the, the 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 momentum has shifted so much on how the public responds to these things, um, and people don't get mad at the players for accepting money, especially in this case, a couple hundred dollars, or whatever, like that they did in the past, and they're looking at it, and you're seeing it framed a lot in the context of this compared to. Uh, Coach O and Dabo's bonuses that they made for reaching the championship game, right? Yeah. And and the amount of money that they're making off of um, what just happened as well. So I think, you know, when you don't have the uproar from the public, I think you have a lot of people making fun of the situation and, again, pointing out the hypocrisy of the coaches. It just it doesn't have the same level of impact. And ultimately, um, you know, some of these, you know, some of the rules regarding, you know, profiting off of your likeness. These are changing and they're going to change. It, it just, I, I think it would be a hard battle for the NCAA to fight um, if they decide to, you know, try to find different ways in the rules and bylaws to, to really, you know, kind of, I don't know, light OBJ on fire and LSU on fire or something for something like this, where there has been so much of a shift in public opinion. And again, there are going to be different rule changes off of likenesses where you're going to be able to like, these are the star players you know they're going to be able to get to pocket some money if they sign endorsement deals and things versus like that this is a couple hundred dollars that people are going to get mad at yeah no doubt uh nicole our back from the athletic hey how's red doing it red all right red is doing just great okay he is um you know he's he's playing and and you know he plays ball all the time so same old, same old. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he's happy that you're back home. Red, by the way, is Nicole's dog, uh, who has yes. uh, quite possibly the best dog name of all, Red Auerbach. So just yes. for those that, that can't figure it out. Hey, enjoy the off season, Nicole. I uh, look forward to reading some of your, your feature stuff. And obviously, if I see anything weird going on in the world of athletics, I'll, I'll hit you up and make sure you get, get to the bottom of it. Okay. Sounds good. I'll, I'll hold you to that. All Thanks, right. Patrick. All right. Thank you. Nicole Auerbach.